Hello. In this second video, we're looking at Sabbath as resistance to oppression. I'm going to take us back to the principles behind the Sabbath and look at what God intended in giving us this command to rest. Now, to set the scene, we need to understand the worldview that the Bible presents here. So, you'll need to let go briefly of whatever you might believe just for a moment and step into the scene presented in the Bible as though you personally were there. Imagine, if you will, that you were a Hebrew slave in Egypt during the rule of Ramesses II, Pharaoh of the New Kingdom of Egypt, who ruled from 1279 to 1213 BC. At this point in the history, he is the most powerful person ever to have existed. And you are one of the Hebrew slaves whose daily work was carried out in the brickworks of his kingdom. It's traditionally thought that perhaps those bricks were required for the building of the pyramids, but Pharaoh builds a lot more than just pyramids. Ramesses II was responsible for an unprecedented building project right through Egypt and Nubia. His demand for bricks was insatiable. However hard you work, you will never keep up with the work. Eventually, the demand for bricks becomes so manic that they begin to cut corners. They demand that you make bricks without the straw used to separate the bricks before they go into the kiln. They take away one of the key elements of the production process, but demand keeps on escalating and you have to keep up with the production targets. There are no rewards for this work, only punishment for failure. Every day is a frantic effort in brick production that never ends until you fall exhausted back into the earth and are yourself subsumed into the clay from which the bricks are made. And then something incredible happens. You are set free. A man called Moses claims to be an agent of God sent to liberate you. You've heard that one before, but to your astonishment, it proves true this time. His God performs mighty acts, laying low your oppressors long enough for you to escape. And then, at the critical moment in your flight, he parts the Red Sea just long enough for you to pass before washing it back over your enemies. This God has just set you free. You want to know more about him. So Moses takes you to the place where he himself met this incredible God, Mount Sinai, in the Sinai Desert. There, God declares that you will be free. You will be given a land of your own, a land that will give you everything your heart could desire, underpinned always by the precious gift of freedom. And to guarantee that freedom, he gives you ten commandments. But these are not the kind of rules you had to obey in Egypt. They're a strange set of rules, underpinned by the most curious commandment of all. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. For six days you shall labour and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. You shall do no work, you or your son or your daughter or your male or female slave, your livestock or the resident alien in your towns. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, but rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and consecrated it. This command comes right in the middle and in Jewish thought, the most important material is always found in the middle. This then is the linchpin of the Ten Commandments. It's the commandments that make sense of the other nine. The commandments to do with God, which come before it, and the commandments to do with our neighbour, which come after it. We will only ever understand who God is and who we are if we understand this commandment. But a commandment to rest, it makes no sense. It is literally a commandment to take a holiday. <laughs> is that too good to be true? Well, we clearly think so, or we wouldn't misinterpret it so consistently as we have done throughout human history. But at its heart, 
It really is as simple as that. Take rest. To get what God is saying, we need to relate it to the first commandment. I am the Lord, your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. The Sabbath is how we learn who this God is, this God who brought us out of Egypt, out of slavery. God is setting himself up in opposition to Pharaoh. Pharaoh commanded constant work. This God commands rest. Pharaoh worshipped the God of death, as did all Egyptians. This God is the God of life. Pharaoh treated the people as a commodity. This God treats them as his own precious people whom he loves. Pharaoh demands productivity from his people. This God demands only relationship. Pharaoh required the people to provide for him. This God provides for his people. Sabbath is offered to us as the tool that breaks apart the whole cycle of slavery and oppression and allows us to resist that, to reset who we are and what our lives are about as people who are free, emancipated, and who exist within a whole new value system. The command to have no other gods is fleshed out by the command to make no idols, whether in the form of anything that is in heaven above or on the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. Why is that? Well, because this is a totally different God from anything we will know in this world. There is nothing in this world that we can use as a metaphor or image for this God. The things of this world will only lead us back into a material world, a system of commodities and consumption. This God can only be known when we stop relating to, to him through these things and start relating to him in love. So first and foremost, the Sabbath is a command to stop obsessing over stuff and come to know him in relationship. It's why in the Jewish and Christian traditions, the Sabbath is the day for worship, fostering that relationship. But there is another issue that Jesus puts his finger on much later on in his teachings. One's life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. Now, clearly, that was not a creed by which Pharaoh lived. For Pharaoh, his immortality was guaranteed by one single thing, amassing stuff. Territory, monuments, wealth, grain, slaves, power. The more he could amass, the greater would be his immortal memory. And his tomb proves that he really did think he could take it with him. He never stopped to enjoy it or ask what it was all for. It was all for his immortal glory. That was his God and its insatiable appetite for stuff was what drove the whole system of slavery. In just one single speech to Moses at the start of chapter 5 of Exodus, Pharaoh makes no fewer than 10 demands for work from the Hebrews. Why are you taking the people away from their work? Get to your labours. You want them to stop working. Let them go and gather straw for themselves. Require of them the same quantity of bricks. They are lazy, lazy, lazy. Let heavier work be laid on them. No one ever rests in this system of pharaohs. Not the slaves, nor the taskmaster and the slave drivers, not even Pharaoh himself. There is just a constant drive for productivity, underpinned by harder and harder work. In any system where our gods are drawn from the material world, they are drivers of a system of production and consumption, which inevitably makes commodities of us all and leads us back to slavery. The God of the Sabbath stands in direct contradiction of the gods of the material world. His creation is not there for our cycle of production and consumption. It has a value of itself. 
And our lives are not expendable in the cause of production. Production is not to consume God's people and his creation, but for their well-being and fruitfulness. Sabbath is offered as resistance to oppression. It challenges us to see ourselves differently. We are not commodities. We are not merely producers or consumers. We are not slaves. We are just as much ourselves when at rest. And we do our work for a different reason. The Sabbath proclaims that we are no longer living under Pharaoh, but under God, who is a totally different kind of Lord. Ramesses II has been dead and buried for 3,000 years, and his glory has long since crumbled back into the dust. All that exhausting, relentless labour was for nothing after all. But there are still many pharaohs of the modern day world. There is the inner workaholic who drives me with constant guilt and will not let me rest even at night when rest is permitted to anyone. There are the pharaohs of commerce who turn consumption into recreation, kidding us that shopping is the best thing we can do on the Sabbath. They reward us with loyalty schemes, telling us that when we buy more, we are being Good consumers, well done, keep buying. Buy this to make you safer, this to make you stronger, this to make you more attractive, this to make you younger, this to make you happy. Buy, buy, buy. Don't stop to wonder why, if these things really work, you need to keep on buying them. Just distract yourself away from all of those uncomfortable thoughts and console yourself with retail therapy. Good consumer. And of course, to afford all this, you need to work harder. To be a good parent, you need to buy your children more stuff. So you need to work harder, take on two jobs, get every adult in the household to work two jobs, and then take turns between you to make it up to the kids by whizzing them around from one activity to the other until they are just as exhausted as you are. Don't stop. Get to your labours. Don't be lazy. Fetch straw. Make the same quantity of bricks. The gods of this world kid us into thinking that we are living life to the max, while deep down within us is the nagging doubt that life might be passing us by in all this activity. But there appears to be no way off the hamster wheel. And to everyone who feels that way, the god of the Sabbath calls out, Ho, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And you that have no money, come, buy and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without price. And then he offers us this challenge. Why do you spend your money for that which does not satisfy? Why do you labour for that which is not bread? Listen carefully to me and eat what is good, and delight yourselves in rich food. Incline your ear, and come to me. Listen, so that you may live. That's what he says in Isaiah chapter 55. The God of the Sabbath stands against the pharaohs of production and consumption and says, let my people go. And he commands his people to rest as an act of rebellion. Now, of course, there is a reality here that we can't get away from. Many of us now have to work on the Sabbath. I do myself. There's no way around that. The economic system of our age requires it. But there are still ways we can rebel against the oppression of that system. And the starting point is to do with our attitude to creation, to work, to rest, to one another and to God. To honour the Sabbath is to resist the whole cycle of oppression which treats you and the world around you as commodities. To live the way of the Sabbath is to say, I will not be a commodity and I will not treat others as my commodity. Not my children, not my slaves, not my livestock, not the alien resident in the land. If you are at work on the Sabbath, 
perhaps you can think about how you treat those who work for you. Are you treating them as commodities? Or are, are you treating them as free, like yourself? Are you making their work relentless and unrewarding? Or do you help to make it fruitful and valuable? Think of the people who serve you, those who clean the space that you are in, those who supply the products you use. And if you are the cleaner, think of the people who are working around you. They may be your boss in the eyes of the world, but though they do not realise it, they are also working for you to pay your wages, to give you a job. How can you treat them in return as more than a commodity, but as people who need to be set free? And can you reassess your whole life? Do you need to work in the way that you do? What drives that need? Are you labouring for that which does not satisfy? Do you need to change your lifestyle in order to resist the oppression of the material world and to foster a life founded on relationship and love? So, now some questions for you at home, either individually or in your study groups, to help you resist oppression and to leave behind the house of slavery. You might want to pause the video at the end of each question and consider it. So first, read Exodus chapter 5 verses 1 to 25. And now spend a few moments thinking or discussing these questions. Question 1. How do you imagine it feels to be a Hebrew slave in this scenario? Question 2. In what ways does your own life feel like that? Question three, what are the pharaohs driving you? Are they external to you or internal? Question four, in what ways can you resist the insatiable demands of production and consumption? Think about who you can treat differently, what priorities you can adjust, and think about what you would, how you would dearly love to live and what adjustments you can make to live a little more like that. Now, I hope you find that thinking fruitful, but one word of caution. Do not beat yourself up over this. Don't turn the Sabbath back into another reason to feel guilty or to try harder. Just do what you can this day to set yourself free. And now we're going to finish with these words of Jesus from Matthew chapter 11, 28 to 30. Come to me, all you that are weary and carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. I wish I knew how it would feel to be free I wish I could break all the chains holding me I wish I could say all the things that I should say say I'm loud say I'm clear for the whole round world to hear I wish I could share all the love that's in my heart Remove all the bars that keep us apart I wish you could know what it means to be me Then you'd see and agree that every man should be free I'm not
Sí.